Right, good evening everybody. Just bear with us a moment whilst we wait to, for people to come in. We have quite a big crowd coming in today. And we also are streaming live to, to our Facebook uh, page, so you can watch it in either place. Um, for those of you who are a family watching, please just put it in the, in the chat box so that we know that, that, that there are more than one of you watching on that particular one. And any, any questions as usual in the, in the Q&A, please. Please um, restrict your questions to, to tonight's subject. Um, any, any questions which don't directly relate to, to what Major General Yoster has to say to us, um, we'll, we will answer by email, but we will not answer during the program. So thank you all for joining us. And um, I think I'm gonna give it another few seconds and then I'm going to hand over to, to Willy Engelbrecht, who's going to host tonight and introduce you to Major General Yoster. And then after his uh, presentation, we will, we will have the Q&A session. So we are still rolling in. Um, I'll give it another 30 seconds. Right, Vili, over to you. you. The screen is all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, and also a very hearty welcome to all our SHR colleagues and their family members, because I know that uh, uh, they normally gather around the, the laptops and the TV when we have these SHR at home webinars, and especially uh, when we deal with such an interesting topic like, uh, like we're gonna have tonight, I'm sure there will be a lot of SHRs and families gathered around. I also would like to uh, welcome the members of the public that are following us on Facebook. Uh, thank you for joining us for yet uh, another insightful SHR at home webinar. Uh, and uh, we are very privileged to hear it from the most informed and most hands-on guest speaker, uh, who, will, who I will introduce the, a little bit later, Major General Retired, um, Johan Joester. He will be discussing anti-poaching and what lies ahead. Uh, over the past decade, <clears throat> anti-poaching capabilities and operations often necessitated a paramilitary uh, approach and hence the reason why we call it uh, a rhino war. And it is none other than, than a rhino war that took place over the past, uh, over the past 10 years. And I'm sure General Joester will, will share some of the past decade with us before we move to, the, to what's lying ahead. This, of course, was never intended to be a long term. It has serious cost implications and unintended uh, consequences for both conservation and for human life, especially our rangers uh, in Kruger Park and other rhino parks who are involved in this, uh, in this rhino war. So um, we need to put together plans for the next 10 years and for the next decade. And that is what uh, tonight is all about. General Joester will be sharing with us uh, the approach to be followed um, for the next 10 years. I would like to introduce uh, Major General Joester to you. He's, of course, a retired military general. He retired from the South African Army in 2006 after 35 years of active service. He was not a pen pusher. He was, uh, he was there uh, fighting wars and... Uh, and a big strategist um, uh, in the army. And um, he then joined in 2013, he was appointed as the commanding officer special projects by Sandparks. And he was based in the Kruger National Park heading the Rhino War in Kruger. Uh, General Eusta spent uh, three years in the park. He set up uh, the strategy and all the, all the processes and um, he then joined 
Uh, he was appoint, subsequently appointed as um, as heading uh, the Wildlife Crime and Corruption Coordination Center at Sand Park's head office in uh, in Grunplof, where he basically was still very much involved in what's happening, not only in Kruger, but also, as you know, we have many other uh, rhino parks. And um, recently he joined the, the Peace Parks Foundation and he's heading the environmental uh, crime unit at Peace Parks Foundation. Uh, he's also seconded to the, the Department of Environmental Affairs. And lastly, I can say that uh, General Joester is a well-respected and a dear friend of the Sandparks Honorary Rangers. And uh, we have been involved in many um, of his projects. And it's a privilege to, uh, to listen to you tonight, General Joester. We're very much looking forward to it. And with that, um, I'm handing over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vali. Let's do the screen sharing and then I'll introduce. And is that good, Vali? Can you guys see that? that that's perfect. Thank you, General. It's fine. Uh, Vali, dear uh, Sandbox Only Rangers friends. Thank you, Honorary Rangers, for, for arranging this. I was, when I logged in tonight, uh, yeah. reminding myself of, of many memories. You know, they say memories live longer than dreams. I, I can think of Bokoslolo bush camps, uh, sunset serenades, uh, poiki course competitions, golf days, handover functions. There were just so many instances where we could share and strengthen each other apart from the material support the moral support i i can tell you meant such a lot it was it was giving with a heart and that is what makes the honorary rangers different from almost all other donors you can go to the honorary rangers for a capital project but you can also go to them and say help me help me equip the rangers and then also for, to the friends over this past 10 years you know, there were people that initially said, this is not serious, it'll blow over. People are calling, crying wolf. Uh, there were people that immediately say, the government and Sand Parks and the department cannot do this. Anyhow, it's over. There's another category that said um, nothing because they became conditioned. It's like we all become conditioned to certain things and it's very dangerous. And then there are people like you. Tongue in cheek, the, 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 the title is Rhino War, and please don't tweet on me now. I can get in trouble. I've been in trouble for this phrase, for this phrase and I, I have no regrets. Uh, you know, we talk about a drug war and a war on many uh, evils in the world, uh, and Billy referred to this. We have one thing in common tonight. We're looking at the decade ahead, and this is not written up in the literature or policy or strategy. I just realized last year we've been in this for a decade. And many people have said, how could we not have foreseen this? How, how did we land here? And the only correlation is that this escalated because of economic growth in Southeast Asia. And I'm not saying with this slide that we're heading for extinction. I, I don't think so. But will we have free roaming, growing rhino populations in Africa that is the reality check that I firmly believe we have to do and that I'd like to share with you. My, I'll try not to lecture you. My presentation will be Kruger-centric and it will be rhino-centric as long as we remember it's illegal wildlife trade. It's about all wildlife and it's about South Africa and our region. Uh, and also for the honorary rangers that has contributed so much to other parks than Kruger. Uh, take nothing away from that. Friends, the reality check. Now, statistics and the figures, we tire each other. We absolutely always dispute and question and, 
uh, sometimes not constructively engage each other on the numbers. You see on the left Africa, and you see the, the yellowish uh, text box there, uh, with a South Africa still housing 75% of the rhino in the world, with a South Africa starting the decade with give or take 22 or 23,000 rhino, and now roughly at 16,000. In this decade, we lost nine to 10,000. Half of them in Kruger. We lost half the population of Kruger. I also would like to go on record that I've personally been involved the past eight years with every press release, every publication, myself and the likes of Dr. Sam Ferreira and other. We've never been under any pressure to cook the figures or not to tell the truth. And I think it's so important in a, in a time when levels of trust is low and this thing, the rhino is so in our face, it is so symbolic of what we have to do. If we cannot save this two ton beast, what can we do? Those are the facts. And, and let us remind each other, we started roughly 23,000, lost 10, we're still at 16 because of biological management, because of breeding. And I dare say, and, and, and please don't quote or, or tweet me on this, uh, let's check the end of the year because the mischievous people say, you're losing less rhino because you have fewer rhino. That's part of the equation. It's definitely not the, the whole picture. The measures that has been taken, the interventions that has been taken has borne good fruit. Friends, that is what we lived for trying to stop the runaway train um, there from end of 2012, ever escalating. You know, people so easily talk about the, the, the epicenter without understanding what it meant. Uh, uh, there are many horror stories out of Africa where uh, elephants were, were poached on an industrial scale. To end up ultimately with three contacts a week, worse than our infamous bush war, uh, to, have, to have six to eight incursions a day and ever escalating the activity and to drive that down to numbers poached. It took us three years, three solid years. And forgive the eye messages as if I go through this, it's sharing some emotion. That was extremely difficult. And the, the bold steps taken by Sandparts at the time to say, let's go paramilitary. And it's, it, it doesn't resonate well with everybody. And let us make sure that we arrest this problem. And I, I think it was the right thing. It was probably a bit late, but uh, that is the result. That is what kept us sane, is that graph, that crocodile mouth opening wider and wider. But it was hard one territory. This is not MBA mumbo jumbo. When I started this in 2013, end of 2012, there's, there's a bigger picture. The only strategic solution is demand management. And people say, you can stop demand. You'll never stop the demand, but manage it. And the other part of the strategic solution is uh, community ownership. And then start small. Don't go into analysis paralysis. If a thing can work, don't be silly. Implement it. Do it because there's little time. And then act now. I was unfortunately in a position at that time. It was so intense. It was just escalating. And you have media, you have political pressure, you have your management, you have the park, you have the rangers looking up to you. Uh, it's a philosophy that serves me rather well. I say this joint, but alone, and it's not because at my age I'm cynical or, or overcritical. People, uh, we, we have the army there, and with, with all due respect, Anti-poaching operations has become so specialized. First of all, if you cannot track, you cannot do anti-poaching operations. As simple as that, you could have all the technology, all the other skills. Tracking is the language of the bush. You go to that bush and you cannot track. You can have all the weaponry, good intent, strategy, everything. Uh, likewise with our police force. Doing their part, but we sort of alone. It has become specialized. It's happening on our beat. And we have to support this. Not going it alone. That is not the point I'm making. Joint, always striving for that. 
but we're hearing this alone. It's happening on our beat and it's not going away. I have this slide, a rather busy one, on, on alliances. And you'll see on the Ranges there, you'll see the Green Scorpions, our department, of which I'm part of now, the police, the provinces where it's not going so well. At the right hand bottom, the Private Rhinos Owners Association. Let us remind ourselves that half the rhinos in our country currently is in private possession. We have to acknowledge that, work through that, and then a plethora of NGOs. And please note that I've put the honorary rangers separate. Um, not because they're so noble or so good or anything. Uh, they're different. You are different because of design, because of a, a decade and previously hard work. Billy, are we still good on sound and, and image and so on? Yes, uh, thank you, General. Uh, you're doing extremely well. Thank you very much, and everything is very clear. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have this slide, and again, it's tongue in cheek. When, when times are dark, friends are few. Um, it's so easy to, to pass a remark, to give a hundred rand, to express your intent. I, over the time, gained a lot of emotional support from none other than the legendary, the late Dr. Ian Player. In his house in the Midlands of Natal, it's about 18 months before he passed. And uh, him encouraging me, complimenting me, but taking serious issue with me on some issues. It, it's priceless. You will all know mentorship and so on. And there I was learning at the day over tea and scones from the man. Prince Harry, guys, I'm not dropping names here. This person came to here, the royal family sent him here, he spent a few months in Africa. His mission was understand what is happening in Africa. And then he spent two weeks in Kruger and he later come back on a paparazzi visit. And when he left after the two weeks, I said, you know all, what, what must I now tell the media when you come again? And all he said is, you tell me what I must tell them. I can also mention that on three subsequent visits to London, I, I would have an audience with him in Kensington Palace. You don't do that to the royal family. Now, unfortunately, it's not anymore. But that's the sort of champions that we could recruit over time. There you see a lot of people in the south of Kruger there. It's known as the Nkomati Interest Group. We termed it that because the south is such a problem. And you have cane farmers and citrus farmers and Mozambicans and municipalities. And there we, that evening, late afternoon, signed that uh, agreement, the NIG. And then, of course, the honorary rangers, two previous chairmen on this photo, always the friends. It's not about personal friendship, a little bit, yes, but it's our cause. And you'll see as I go around now, Willy, I, I'll put the honorary ranger badge whenever I thought there was direct involvement. And to our friends that are non-honorary rangers, it is nothing other than a bit of acknowledgement and a reality check on that also. The thin green line, the much spoken about thin green line, and it has also, also become a bit of a cliche. When I took this job, I, it took me even prior to accepting the job uh, to understand that it's about people and about the Ranger Corps. And I unfortunately had to take this task six months after that general strike in Kruger. And the whole Kruger setup was not geared for this. And I, this is not undue criticism. This is not generalizing. The, the structure, the support, the logistics, the strategy, the, the conducting of operations, it couldn't work. It was impossible for it to work. And so we have the Rangers. And let me stop here because this is, this is you, because you support the Rangers. You will not necessarily buy us a new helicopter. People, the, the risks for the thin green line, first of all, is range it down. You can get killed. I'm not making a, a, an emotional statement. You can get killed every day. You can get killed middle of the night. A ranger can be convicted. Unfortunately, there are 
fatalities, when, when self-defense, and every such case is investigated by the police. A ranger can just not be able later on to, to face up to, the, to the, the emotional stress because it's ongoing and, and friends, there's another decade of this ahead of us. A ranger become alienated because you're the hero in Kruger and with the honorary rangers and with the management, you're not necessarily a, a, a hero when you go to Mkuslu to the spa on Saturday to do shopping because you arrested somebody. And then unfortunately, uh, a ranger betrayed. Rhino money by many people and, and this does to ranger morale is devastating. And of course, uh, many friends, Sand Park's on the range right behind the rangers. And in the coming slides, I will explain that a little bit. We, we had to train the rangers and you know, it's so easy to say uh, a, 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 a funny term was developed, milit remilitarization, and it's, it, it's something sinister. We had to make sure that we go paramilitary. It's not military. The military operate in sections, companies, platoons, battalions with the heavy support weapons. We operate in two-man teams. We had to train our rangers to give them the best possible chance of facing rogues, plundering our resources on a daily basis and repetitively. That is all that we did. And in the process, you utilize military techniques and methodology. It's easy to adopt the, 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 the doctrine and have all the, the, the weaponry available. And there was the sandbox on the rangers. When we first had to do this training, all of a sudden, you must find a service provider. You must pay for it. And throughout the whole process, over two years of retraining rangers, the only rangers was there financially and otherwise. Then ranger wellness, and I can almost see some of my colleagues leaning forward and looking at this. Uh, we started with Project Relax. My wife and I returned from a Christmas visit in of 20. 13, it was on 24, 25, 26 December, and she said to me, it's not necessarily that a ranger post had to be a dump, because really, really, it, we could do better. And we embarked on Project Relax, and honorary rangers adopted the ranger post, and play a bit of sport again, do a vegetable garden, make sure that the, there's festivity, and make sure you look at the spiritual welfare, and then right there in the middle, Project Embrace. That was the first group of ladies we got together in 2012, 2013, Rangers Wives, working with resilience, working with coping, like we all go on these courses and sometimes it's enriching and sometimes it is just finding ourselves and of course the Honorary Rangers right in front there. And I would argue Honorary Rangers that Embrace is the most important project in the history of the honorary rangers, and forgive me being a bit dramatic about it, we have to invest in the people. We cannot say that this cannot last. This will continue. It's like a policeman or a soldier now saying, I'm giving up because the war is too tiring. It, it, there's no way out of this if we want to do justice to our resources and our uh, natural assets. The air wing, it sounds so luxurious. You, know, you have an air wing. How is that possible? We doubled this thing and the honorary rangers was there. I've seen the honorary rangers spending money on infrastructure, hangars, light aircraft, ultralight aircraft. John Turner said to me at the time, we don't pay salaries. And ultimately, they helped out with a fixed wing pilot. Ultimately, they appointed a logistic coordinator because it's just not there. Without this air wing, the, the figures and the stats that I showed you earlier would have been a lot different. A world-class little airwing right there in the bush. Mobility. I never thought one would drive in Kruger off-road. You don't go off-road. Because it's wilderness, it's sacred ground. We had to. We had to go uh, gravel road mobility. We had to improve 
road infrastructure here and there because if you you have to react to certain instances. Honorary Rangers, thank you for participating. Thank you for acquiring some of these field mobility vehicles. There's no other way, unfortunately. There's nothing as bad as getting an early warning, getting uh, an ears up, and you're not able to react in life in here. The K9 unit, guys, in end of 2012, where there were six K9s, we experimented with it. I built this K9 center, UBI message, with American donor money, but it was a shell. And the honorary rangers and the Lowfeld region, and I don't know whether Grant and Leslie and them are on, they worked there. We had to do a bit of lawns, a bit of shrubs, a bit of uh, praying areas for the dogs, uh, storage for, 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 for the food. Um, the Sandbox only Rangers can rightfully put their badge on this world-class canine center. I think we have about 60 canines and it has evolved to different types of dogs and it's a winning recipe. Now technology. Uh, friends, it's so it's so easy to, to either or. I, I'm, I'm concerned that people often say, yeah, these are playthings. What about technology? You need boots on the ground. Of course you need boots on the ground. This is a world-class mobile radar that was designed by the CSIR with a, a radar built at the Reutek Radar Systems in Stellenbosch and integrated here. It is a dead set. It works. It's only an example that I put out here. We, we, we mustn't exclude the rangers from the fourth industrial revolution. It is not necessary. All over Africa, you have smart parks. Technology in ranger, in ranger terms does not mean that you have weapons of mass destruction or some other AWACS aircraft. It means that you have connectivity and situational awareness. Get early warning, send your rangers to the right place and minimize the risk when they go there. And here I have a lovely little story I have for Ayat. Now, how did the, the uh, Sandbox Only Rangers become involved with this? When I met with John and, and Janssen uh, early 2013, the first thing I asked, not the first, one of the first thing I asked them, give me money to draw up a roadmap for technology. Janssen, chairman at the time, staunch business person that he is, refused. He said, what do you get? I said, I get a report. He said, I don't pay for reports. And when I approached them two months later for the third time, I think they just gave up and said, well, let's give you more money. A million rand for the people. We had a, we had a roadmap. Well, how do you utilize technology? It was written in the national strategy, but nobody knew. And to, to, to this day, many people don't know. Don't exclude your rangers from the benefit of technology. It does not mean that you don't have to have a hardcore ranger. It means that you work more intelligently. The proverbial mm -hmm. smart park. You use mac maximize, uh, uh, you maximize your observation and situational awareness. It does not take nothing away from ground intelligence, uh, informants outside the park. It enhances. And I personally believe, Vali and, and the good people, that the wow in Africa will come from technology. The, uh, satellite technology will soon become affordable. It will change the face of connectivity. That will change the face of many things. And, and, and I'm quite sure I'm not dreaming here. You can read there. Yes, often we want to run fast, get it done with. This is the, ve this is the vehicle of a ranger today, a section ranger. That is the, what you do. Uh, yes, you still do conservation and you check the dam levels and the fences and the areas and the ocean. We had to go next level in Kruger to the state of the art uh, jock joint operation center. That thing in itself means nothing. It's a people inside there, but it's just so huge. And the honorary rangers was there. People, I, and, and again, at the risk of being anecdotal, I marked out that building with, with mealy meal. And the uh, little monkeys were sitting eating the meal and many people in Kruger checked this old man, what, what the heck is this? And when we erected it, some of the furniture, much of the work there was done by honorary rangers and honorary rangers that their duty in that 
mission area joint operation center. You've got to have it in some other way. You start with a vehicle, maybe you have something in a garage. In Kruger, that is what was uh, needed. Now, a friend of mine said, uh, money is overrated, <laughs> but there's always the problem of money. Uh, none of this, none of what I showed you was, was funded. How can you expect a sandbox making a profit out of five of the 22 parks, a fiscus that is shrinking every day. So I assume the role of fundraiser. And I, I just want to make it clear, the money for this is in the US. And Vidya and I spoke informally earlier. There's money. It requires an effort. It's the reach is long. There's money for this. Even post-COVID, there's money for this. Uh, there we are in the, in the office of the ministry in London, uh, the environmental ministry. And then, of course, the Buffett uh, Foundation uh, uh, award or grant of a quarter of a billion at the time. He did that on a five-page document. It was a five-pager only. Not, and he never inquired where, what we will acquire from which supplier. He only wanted to see the cash flow and the result. And then there was the honorary rangers, always there, bringing in much needed funding, always focused on the real uh, uh, requirements, and that is important. We, must, we mustn't get caught up because what I, between what I call industry push. This industry has become alive, and donor pull. Industry go to, to the donors and say they need a drone or they need something. We must guard against that. This is an important slide, and I think there's been a question earlier about it. I, I simply cannot understand why every time we talk law enforcement, in the current paradigm, we must oppose it or set it up against communities. How do we think communities can exist if we don't maintain some law and order? Why do we think they don't want it? There's no evidence that they don't want it. Why do we think that the two million people west of Kruger on that fault line will invade our ground? If they wanted to do that, it will be a total different story. So we have a reality. We have these poor people recruited as, as poachers, the savagery of poaching and the demand and the reality of our communities. We never excluded this. In my second month of tenure, I wrote this up, and, and uh, if I may say, part of our national strategy, standing on the five legs, two of which is law enforcement and communities, I'm just concerned that why do we put the thin green line in between the two? Here and there, people and academics and others say, yeah, if only we spend all the money we spend on law enforcement, on the communities, and with due respect, if somebody can convince me at any time, that that, that, that could happen, that you just, it is simple, you stop everything, you call the troops home, and you just spend on communities. I think that those involved in community projects must follow the example we've set in law enforcement, getting the security cluster departments together, it's your SARS, your police, your border control, your army, your police, and get together the welfare departments, those that must make sure that we get the communities to work. It's a long road. There's no doubt it's a strategic object. In the meantime, law enforcement is, a, is an intervention of necessity. Um, people like us who have been to war know our futile worries. Why would we pursue this any day longer than is necessary? <laughs> There's just no logic. I, my plea almost is let not, let's not oppose this. Let's not set this up against each other. It's not necessary. It, it's not helpful. You've got to do both and a lot of other things without sounding like a compromise. I'd quickly like to tell a story, friends of Mozambique. When I took this job in 2013, about 80% of our poaching occurred from Mozambique. The, the, the public was livid. There was serious pressure. People say we must build a Berlin Wall. Other people said uh, let's do hot pursuit. Other people said, shoot to kill. 
when I went to Maputo the first time, I was sheltered down in, in meetings. We worked with seven parties there, including the Tosano Foundation. We established the Operation the Bombo at the time. And it ended up with this photo. It was so cumbersome to travel through the border post. We just jump over the fence. You can see it in the back line there. And we meet with the authorities. And sometimes they would then illegally enter our territory and we go to the other side of the fence, depending on where the best shade was and who gave the best coffee and cookies. When by 2015, just over 30% of poaching occurred from Mozambique. And that story is continuing. We don't have time for it now. It can be done. I believe we should go more Pan-African. I just took this photo. Uh, I looked at the various uniforms at a, at a conference at the Wildlife College three or so years ago. We, we have to look at this regionally, and it sounds so easy, and we all agree, but we, we don't do something about it, really. I'm nearing the end of this. We looked at the Kruger at the time because it's a thousand kilometer around the boundary. The boundary of Kruger, so if you drive from Pretoria to Beaufort West, you've driven around it once. If you uh, commute between Pretoria and Joburg and you've done it 20 days, you've driven around Kruger once. So we looked at where the concentration of assets were. The IPZ in the south, very much technology enhanced. Then the big success story to this day, working in zones, borders, and boundaries become fault lines. So in that concept, you look into Mozambique, into the concessions, into the private reserve, and it worked for us. And we learned lessons from them, see various lessons. And on the right-hand side of the slide, remember there are other parks and protected areas. Remember the private sector, remember the region. Of the nine or so countries in Africa where we have rhino, six of them come from South Africa. And, and to, to draw close to a conclusion, we decided two years ago, and, and that is what I'm doing around today, to work on zones, wildlife. These zones are demarcated primarily around key populations of rhino. A key population is not almost the biggest population, but you benefit all the wildlife in a, in a zone. You have a protected area, you have borders and boundaries, but you think zone. Because in that zone, you might have eight protected areas, one mine, one municipality, one rural community, and a number of other farmers. The Greater Kruger Environmental Protection Forum is the, is the, is the benchmark, what we established in 2015, beginning 16, uh, led by, by OpenGate and supported well by private. Uh, it's functional, as you can see the, uh, the key at the bottom. We have a, a, a functional, not fully functional zone in the Waterberg, and we have numbers, and we have in every zone, in most of the zones, you have a national park, provincial park, and private parks and private owners. The Zululand zone functioning well, the frontier zone in the Eastern Cape, Black Rhino country, and the Garden Route zone. Their head office there, outside Mosul Bay, up to Otsuring, functioning so well. We have initiated the Kalari zone, the Northern Cape, and work in progress is the platinum zone in northwest. A spatial perspective, the Kalari zone is out of perspective, out of context here, because they're so widely spread. So please don't look at the geographical coverage. If we in the coming decade focus there, we work together, we build with the private sector, we get donor money in, we get the World Bank in, which we are getting, we get the uh, US aid, which we are getting. We were advised of a, of a grant uh, this Friday. And built on that, we can, we can get a lot more proactive. We can enter a decade, because we cannot repeat the previous decade. That, that we mustn't do. Some of it, we must continue. We'll have to change the gears a little bit. Uh, by the way, that Northwest cone is only because we included the John Hume property. We call it Project Southern Cross, and you'll hear a lot about it and, and hope that you will become ambassadors for it. We know the patterns in those zones. Uh, this is just uh, diagrammatically. 
we know how the weapons go, how the money go, how the strong points are, are set up by the poachers and how they go poaching. Finally, we have a moderate win. It's a hard one. Poacher numbers down. And it's not only because we have fewer I know. I, I really think at the end of the year, you will all be pleasantly surprised with marginal growth in population. A strong one can only happen if we collapse the network. Who are we? We are the Green Scorpions, we are the department, we are sand parks, we are conservationists, we are private industry. We don't want to do the police's work. It, it's impossible, but this is happening on our beach. Let's help them. Of course, the total win, I mean, there's no demand. To this end, we established the Environmental Enforcement Fusion Center, a cell in, in the department, operating from a, from a satellite office with a keen analyst capability, investigative capa capability, and assessor capability, and the, and the ability to implement projects in the various zones, very much zone. You take human intelligence and technology intelligence, you give evidence, and you help your police get some arrest, get some convictions. And, and Billy, good friends, that's, that is an overview like I said, a, a bit leaning towards Kruger, a bit leaning towards Rhino, part of wildlife as, as, as we see it. And as we uh, responsibly plan to go about it in this initial years of the next decade. We don't have a lot of time. I started off by saying, I know we're going extinct, but a lot of things has happened. If we don't make sure now that we get traction and get positive growth, uh, the, the wrong things will happen on our beach. Thank you all for, for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General Jester. Um What an interesting talk. And thank you very much for, uh, for also promoting the work that the Sandparks Honorary Rangers uh, are doing. I'm sure my, my colleague and good friend Peter Brooks at the end of this presentation will, uh, will share with the public um, where, to, where to, put your, to put your money uh, if you would like to support our, uh, our goal. So without further ado, General, if we can perhaps uh, go to uh, Q&As, and because we are, of course, dealing with a very sensitive, uh, sensitive issue, some of the questions may be sensitive. And uh, by all means, I know that you are a discreet person, and uh, and and you know, I'm sure if you if you feel it's too sensitive, you can, of course, uh, uh, indicate indicate that to us. But I'm going to ask you, uh, you the first question is. Why were drones unsuccessful in Kruger application and were unmanned blimps considered for surveillance, particularly along the western boundary of the KNP? Bali, thank you. I, the drone, uh, I was blamed by industry a couple of years ago to say that Yosta don't support drones. Um, there was drone fever. The number of times that the, the minister then approached me and say, but I, I've been briefed by so-and-so, why don't you do it? it? It was number, it was many times. So we embarked upon a trial. It cost us 5 million rand of donor money granted to test drones over a full year so that we cover all seasons, all vegetation, all weather conditions, uh, all geographic uh, conditions. Uh, it proved that in Kruger, the vastness of Kruger, it doesn't work, and it proved that you cannot chase poachers with it, necessarily. Drones has an application. My philosophy is big park, big view. Uh, here and there, you have to utilize unmanned because it's the most affordable, but more likely to manage your asset. It's so useful to manage your asset, to know where your, where your asset are grazing. Are you missing some of them? How do you react to them? And then in a smaller park, it has a different application. But it has an application in Kruger, a limited application, unfortunately. And we mustn't only look at the Kruger scenario. We must look at drones, and we must look at, look at the payload, the sensors that you can put on a drone. And I predict that soon we'll be able to do censuses 
with with uh, uh, sensors and filters on drones and think how that will change. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. I'm uh, going to move the, to the next question right away. The question is how much external force is placed on the rangers through their families? Uh, for example, uh, does it happen that, that syndicates sort of um, threaten rangers by saying to them, you either tell us where the rhinos are or we will do something to your families? Does that happen? Friends, like with corruption, it starts in a subtle way. A, a prospective poacher or working for a network will, will ask the ranger, tell us when your section ranger is on leave. Tell us where the water is. The, the rhino must drink daily, so in the dry season you tell him where the water is. They will approach people when the fridge is broken, the bucket is broken, and the kids need money for school. And it starts small. And unfortunately, a lot of pressure is born brought to bear on our ranger. Uh, a, a lot. And an undue amount of pressure is brought onto them. And there's something that you solve with the leadership, but beyond that, we have to we have to act. We have to be more decisive with the rogue elements that lures our rangers into corruption. It is unfortunately a big factor. Thank you very much, uh, General. And I, I suppose that is where Project Embrace uh, plays a big role as well to, uh, to, uh, to counsel those members because it must be very traumatic for them. But we also uh, received a very interesting question uh, through Facebook uh, from Devin um, Hansen. His question is, how many poachers are released? How many of the poachers that are released are recaptured? Uh, can you share that uh, stats with us? I, I cannot share the stats. Uh, it's a difficult stat, meaning how, how, how do you determine that it involves many departments over many provinces? But it is a factor. The, our big question is, how do you get a conviction? The victory in anti-poaching will not be in the bush. It will be in the courts. It will be in the boardrooms where the right decisions are taken in the courts where criminals are convicted. And many donors around the world are prepared to give money, but they say then that must be the measure. And uh, we are lacking. South Africa is lacking. It has improved a lot. Let's again be, be also fair. Uh, the turnaround time, the severity of sentences, and the success rate has improved a lot over time. It's, uh, it's the one thing, it's the one aspect that has to improve because that has a bearing of the motivation of the ranger. To see people released, to see them return to crime, there are quite a number of poachers in Kruger that has been around for too long and uh, that are roaming free because of a judicial system that not necessarily is responsive enough and doesn't support the cause well enough. I'm sorry about that, pardon. Interesting question, given the circumstances uh, we live in and, uh, and the political situation today, maybe this is a slightly political question. It says, is there any truth about untouchables in high places in the South African government? or neighboring countries when it comes to rhino poaching and protecting rhino poaching syndicates? Well, it's a, it's a fair question. And even if I knew I couldn't tell you, it's not the level on which we operate. It's not as if we only want to catch poachers. I explained to you that we're doing the networks. And unfortunately, one assumes that the network uh, reaches quite high into the into the hierarchies here and there. I, however, I, I don't have knowledge or insight that I've gained over the past decade that, that really makes that the main factor. 
It is a factor. We cannot, we cannot ignore it. So, loaded question, fair question. Uh, I'm answering like a politician here, not, not saying anything. Yeah, very diplomatic. Thank you, General. <laughs> I didn't expect less time, uh, less on my side. Uh, General, just uh, we, we had a question from Leticia Steinberg, which, which is also very interesting. And I know for a fact that when you were still uh, in Kruger, you accompanied many celebrities from the East to expose them to what happened. Now, Leticia Steinberg's question has got to do, she's asking, what are the chances to reduce the demand for rhino horn and what more can be done to eliminate the demand? The, the question of demand touches on the strategic issue. We have to manage demand. You can never make it zero, make it manageable. The, we've, we, we have to continue with all the good work that is being done. There are diplomatic efforts, bilaterals, Sometimes it's meet and greet and grip and grin. It doesn't add a lot. You've got to continue doing that. There are wonderful initiatives by the Peace Park Foundation, by the Wilderness Foundation, in schools and, and other target groups in Vietnam and, and China. We, we must continue that. The use of celebs, yes, we've, we've done it often and spent time and helicopter and dinners, it adds value because they will sit and, and tweet at the table and do a million, two, three, four million. Uh, and it has impact. But I dare say uh, we mustn't overestimate. Keep doing that as part of the toolbox. We mustn't, mustn't overestimate it. But every little bit we can put into the consumer countries, into the end user, we must put, it'll take off pressure. Uh, General, also uh, maybe a very sensitive question because this is uh, asking for your personal opinion and you are welcome to, uh, to also answer it diplomatically. Uh, the question is, yeah, are you in favor of legalizing the sale of rhino? I believe, and I must be guarded because I'm a, I'm a civil servant of sorts, uh, it can be part of a solution. To think to think it will solve the problem is also not true, but you can destabilize the market. The economic leg of this campaign we have not touched, and that can touch the economic leg. And then again at the risk of being anecdotal, I can remember the late Dr. Player sitting in his, in his, uh, his lounge there in the Midlands, and he ended up with Trey, and he took serious issue with me when I was hesitant about it. He said to me, what the hell else are you going to do? And it resonates with me to, to this day. I personally cannot see why one would not set it up. One mustn't underestimate the regulatory framework, but one mustn't underestimate the proceeds from it and that you can satisfy a part of the market. But we must also not underestimate the psyche of people. For decades, we've told you, you shall not, you mustn't do this. Now, yeah, it's actually right. You can buy the one now. So it's very complex, but I, I honestly think it, it can be a good tool in the toolbox. Thank you, General. Um, General, if it's okay with you, there are so many questions still, and I see the participants stay very stable. So if it's okay with you, we are going to, uh, we are going to shoot with, uh, with a few questions still. Um, there's, there's one question, of course, you know, uh, me living down in, in the Cape, uh, very dear to me, but the question was, comes from Elrina Fersfeld, and obviously in your new position now, um, you, you, you may be in a, in a better position to answer this. The question is, is it possible to get a similar war going against abalone poaching? Very, very valid question. We must talk wildlife. We must talk cycads. The abalone is atrocious. I, I, I think it's totally underestimated. The pangolin part. We have to look at illegal wildlife trade strategically. Then get it down to understand uh, combating wildlife crime, and then you do the anti-poaching measures. Indeed, indeed, it's, it's overdue. And 
it's something that deserves management and otherwise attention. Uh, thanks, General. Um, uh, uh, another question, and there were quite a few questions regarding the subject, uh, and I'm just going to read the first uh, the first question. And, and like I said, there were there were others regarding the subject. The question is: How important is it to keep open the Skakuza Regional Court? And I think another question said: Was it a good thing to close it down? <laughs> it's very important. I personally put in a lot of effort, of my personal effort, into getting that court there. Uh, it changes a lot of procedure and urgency. It has a, it's a court with an excellent reputation. We need the court there. It's not a good idea. And it's sad that, why was it closed down? Because I couldn't see real valid reasons it was with due respect, personal preference. But let me hasten to add, again being anecdotal, I, shortly after we had the dedicated court there, I was in Skakuz, I had to testify in a case against people who shot at us in the helicopter. And the morning I rode there, I, I felt so good because this is the court and I thought I'll sit in for two cases and there was the range of testifying and the uh, accused got a hefty sentence of 17 years. Uh, getting the park illegally, firearm and poaching. But I realized the futility that morning. As I, as I drove up to the court, the buckies stopped and people, young male people got out into the court and there was this one guy sentenced. And it's uh, another breadwinner out of the system. And how many more must we do? But like the anti-poaching, it's got to be done. We, we mustn't be half out at the bar of this Kukuza port is very important. It's a great pity that we are where we are. It, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be closed. Thank you, General. Um, yeah, like I say, uh, the people are hanging in there <laughs> and the, the questions are rolling in at the moment. We've got an interesting question from Louis Lemma. He's asking, uh, in your years of involvement in the counter poaching efforts, what would you say have been the most positive measures or achievements and how can this be utilized to achieve further success? Hard to single out, but we need a, a range of core that are disciplined so that they can become, be, can become proud and that they can be, become efficient and then effective. In terms of their training, their preparation, their, their, their persistence and their perseverance. Uh, you can take nothing away from that. However, if you don't have intelligence, you will not win because you will be chasing the people proverbially in the bush. We have to look at a capability and the capability that we have established in Kruger was a balanced capability that addressed the various facets of a modern day anti-poaching unit that are not devoid of the ethics of conservation, but know their job because there's a long road ahead. Thank you, General. Um, I, I'm only going to ask uh, two more questions to you, and then there's a general question. One thing that struck me um, through the whole question, the Q&A section, is everybody starts their question by thanking you for the most informative and great talk. And I think it's necessary that you know that. Uh, the, the people are, are all very appreciative of, uh, of you sharing the information with us in, a, in an honest and a straightforward way. So um, the next uh, question, uh, and there are actually quite a few questions that deal with the subject. And, and, and let me, uh, I'll put it to you, I'll sum it up this way. And it is, um, if you flood the iron market with legally harvested rhino horn. And some, some people uh, suggested that we must actually start breeding rhino to, to, to flood the Asian market, et cetera, et cetera. The question is, will this minimize poaching due to the demand being less? Is there any truth to this? 
I think you summarized it, Willie. Uh, it will decrease the demand. It will destabilize the market, especially in this initially, and, and hit, hit, hit the black market. Uh, it can be part of a solution. And uh, if, and again, it's a personal opinion. If you then have to farm with 5,000 that I know to keep 20,000 free roaming, certainly, even to the purest, it's doable. It's maybe a, a way to look at it. We we have to let the rhino help us also, uh, in a manner of speaking. And if the harvest of horn and the, and a, a legal market can be created, I think it can be part of a solution. Again, please don't tweet on me. It's politically laden. It will be a political decision, but I am I'm direct about it. It can be part of a solution. Uh, thank you, General. Last question to you before I deal with a general question and then uh, make some closing remarks. Um, uh, the question is, uh, comes from Beverly Elliott from Agalas. She's saying, uh, um, is there any reason why we cannot initiate an international court for wildlife poaching in South Africa? I think we must think regionally. Yes, so we, this is an international question. The international community mustn't turn their backs on us. The world as a rhino, because South Africa has seen to it that the world as a rhino through the work of the late Dr. Player. In the early 50s, there were no rhino in Kruger. That man had the courage and the insight to make sure that we have rhino. But I think we must try SADC and the region with international backing. We definitely need the advocacy, the support, and the resources that can come with it. General, thank you very much. Um, I, from my side, and I'm sure I talk uh, on behalf, I say this on behalf of almost 2,000 honorary rangers, but not only the honorary rangers, I, I, I say this on behalf of everyone concerned about rhino poaching. I would personally like to salute you as your own Joester for everything you did. I know you went out of your way. You worked long hours. And I'm sure this war was far more intense than you have ever experienced in your, in your military career. But we honor you and we salute you for everything you did and for being a great friend to, to the honorary rangers. And thank you very much for everything, uh, for everything you did. Um, and and with that, General, I would uh, I would just like to you know there were so many questions from people that were asking will they be able to view uh, this webinar at a later stage? And I'm sure it will be available on the Sandparks on the SHR Facebook page. So if you visit our Sandparks on the Ranger Facebook page, you will be able to. Um, to revisit uh, this most interesting talk. And thank you very much, General. Uh, like I said, we, we honor you and we salute you and thank you for what, uh, what you've done and for what you've shared with us tonight. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you, Honorary Rangers. Thank you, friends. Please don't stop doing what you're doing. And what you say honestly doesn't make me feel important, but it makes me feel good. And feel good is good. We all know need a little bit of it uh, so so that we we can continue and and uh, i salute the honorary rangers thank you very much and with that i'm going to hand back to peter brooks that will share uh, some more information with us and uh, thank you peter thank you general thank you thank you all for joining us tonight it was uh, i think we'll all admit it was a very interesting talk very uh, enlightening and uh, I think most of us don't even realize half of the problems that exist behind the scenes. So once again thank you for joining us as Billy said this is available on our Facebook page and um, for the honorary rangers who, who are watching a, a link to the to the webinar will also be circulated within the next few days and that will be available for for you to to watch it directly from from Zoom for, for a week or for the next week. So once again, thank you for joining us and 
we look forward to seeing you next week. Next week, we're taking a totally different track and we're going to go and dive in False Bay. So if you're interested in a coastal talk, please join us next week for a, for a talk, um, a sea-based talk instead of a land-based talk. Thank you once again for joining us and good night to you all.